Hi everyone, my name is FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black 2, using only Dark-type Pokemon. To see what I define as hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the Gym Leader's Ace, and we're playing on set mode. So let's talk Dark-type Pokemon. Dark-type Pokemon are a mixed bag. Prior to the physical special split, most Dark-type Pokémon were pretty bad, since Dark moves were considered special in the early generations, and for some reason Game Freak decided to make almost every Dark-type a physical attacker. Add that to the fact that most Dark-type attacks are pretty underwhelming, and you've got a type that is a lot cooler to look at than it is to use. But then, in Generation 4, Dark-type Pokémon greatly benefited from moves like Crunch and Bite becoming physical moves. They also got a lot of cool new moves like Dark Pulse, Nasty Plot, and Sucker Punch. And basically every generation since has made Dark types better and better. Well, except Generation 6, which gave them a fairy type weakness. But generally speaking, Dark type Pokemon have a lot of really fun tricks up their sleeves. They tend to have really interesting move pools and abilities that make for some pretty fun playstyles. And some of the designs, despite being a little too edgy, are really cool. In Pokemon Black 2, there are a surprisingly large number of Dark type Pokemon to choose from. There are a grand total of 13 fully evolved Dark-type Pokémon in the Unova Pokédex. Although, for some reason, there's a handful of Pokémon in the Unova Pokédex that you can't actually catch until you get the National Dex. So, I'm not really sure why they're even here in the first place. But it does mean that Tyranitar and Crawdon are off the table. Also, because I play with level caps, and the level cap for the Elite Four of this game is level 58, I won't actually be able to get a Hydreigon, which evolves from Zuelos at level 64. Why does it evolve so late? I don't know, but it means we're stuck with Dumb and Dumber for this playthrough. Still, that's 11 encounters, including some very powerful Pokémon. So this should be easy, right? Right? Just as a quick reminder, before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to reroll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Okay, let's see how this goes. I start the game by meeting up with Bianca to choose my starter. None of the starters are eligible encounters, but I pick Snivy so that my rival Undark will have a Tepig, which will gain the fighting type upon evolution, and therefore theoretically be the hardest to take down. As soon as I'm given Pokeballs, I go to Route 19 and catch my first Dark-type Pokémon, a Purloin. I name him Thanos, Snivy goes in the box, and then the challenge officially begins. Now in case Thanos' incredibly foreboding design threw you off, Purloin is not a particularly good or strong Pokémon which is a bit of a problem since Thanos is the only eligible encounter for the first two gym battles. The first gym leader is Charon, who specializes in normal types, and he has a Patrat and a Lillipup. Patrat is pretty garbage, but compared to Purloin, Lillipup has a better attack stat, a better defense stat, and thanks to Stab, it actually hits pretty hard with Tackle. Meanwhile, Purloin is stuck with a non-Stab Scratch, the very inaccurate Fury Swipes, and that's it. This is gonna be pretty difficult. But I don't even make it to Charon on this attempt. I actually wipe to Charon's gym trainer. It's not even particularly close since he gets a critical hit and I don't have fury swipes yet. Well, let's take it from the top. On attempt two, I managed to successfully not wipe to Charon's gym trainers. This is partially because I was at a slightly higher level so that I knew fury swipes, and partially because this time around, I made sure to load Thanos up with as many attack EVs as possible. Patrat on Route 19 give attack EVs, and thanks to the way that experience curves work in this game, you can get a fairly large amount of EVs without hitting the level cap. At such a low level, it doesn't make that much of a difference, but it's not nothing. After that, it's time to fight Charon. Scratch just isn't strong enough to beat Charon's Pokémon, so I need to just use Fury Swipes and hope that it doesn't miss and that we get a decent number of hits each turn. Charon leaves Patrat, and Thanos starts out with a monstrous four Fury Swipes as Patrat retaliates with a tackle. I go for a Scratch, which unfortunately leaves Patrat with just a sliver. So on the next turn, Charon uses a Potion to heal, and Thanos hits a very limp two Fury Swipes. Better than missing though, buddy. On the next turn, we get lucky and connect with three Fury Swipes to knock out the Patrat. Thanos levels up, which is allowed according to my rules, since the gym battle has already started. And then Lillipup comes out. Thanos then delivers four Fury Swipes, one of which crits, taking out more than half of Lillipup's HP as it goes for a workup. With a workup boost though, this could be pretty scary if I miss a Fury Swipes or just simply don't get enough hits off. But Thanos does not mess around. He takes out the Lillipup on the next turn. Easy stuff. Just like taking an Infinity Stone from an Android. That's badge number one. Next up, we've got the second gym leader, Roxy. Her level cap is 18, which is still too low to evolve Thanos. 
Fortunately, Charon did give us the TM for return, which gives Thanos a significantly more reliable move than Fury Swipes. Roxy leads coughing. It does a bit of damage with a few tackles, as Thanos takes it out with return. We do also manage to get Roxy to waste her Super Potion here, so that's nice. Once the coughing goes down, Roxy's Whirlipede comes out. It wastes a turn using Protect, and then goes for the double Protect. So we get some free damage off. This means that we should be able to survive an attack and finish it off with two more returns. So after another turn of Whirlipede wasting time protecting, we hit a return, which leaves Whirlipede with a sliver, and then it crits with Venishock. Well, I guess it's time to go back to the Fury Swipes roulette. This time, I get a Brave Purloin, which is actually pretty good since Thanos is so fast anyways that the minus speed isn't really a problem. I clinch another win against Charon thanks to some good luck with Fury Swipes, and then before I know it, I'm back to facing Roxy. But this time, I have a strategy. And that strategy is to not lose, which was my mistake last time. Thanks to a Silk Scarf and some better stats, Roxy's coughing goes down to two returns. The damn thing gets a crit though, so I'm not looking too good when Whirlipede comes out. But again, thanks to the Silk Scarf, return is a two-hit kill. Had I activated Whirlipede's Poison Point here, or it actually just crit with Venishock again, I'd be dead. But it didn't, and that's because my strategy worked, and that's badge number two. With my new level cap, Thanos is finally able to evolve into Lyopard, which even if it isn't a great Pokemon, it's definitely better than Purloin, so I'm not complaining. I'm also able to go to the secret garden spot in Castelia City and catch an Eevee. I name her Bellatrix, and after running around for a few minutes using my super fast Nintendo DS, Bellatrix evolves into Umbreon. Unlike Thanos, Umbreon is a pretty phenomenal Pokemon since it's very bulky and gets access to recovery. Especially for monotype challenges, something that can sponge a hit is a godsend. I can theoretically catch a Dark-type Sandile or Scraggy in the sands of Route 4 right now, but I decide to delay that encounter. I'll explain why in a sec. For now, it's time to face Berg. And you'd think that this would be yet another difficult gym badge, since Berg uses bug types, which are super effective against my dark types. But Bellatrix is pretty incredible, and Berg is pretty crap. The only bug type move that his Pokemon know is Struggle Bug, which is a very weak special attacking bug type move. Berg leads Swadloon, and I lead Thanos. I start repeatedly using Sand Attack as Swadloon just tries to connect with a few string shots. After six Sand Attacks, I switch to Bellatrix. While crawling through the sewers, I found an old apple, so I let Bellatrix chew on it. This allows her to recover a bit of HP every turn as she sets up with Workup. Even when Swadloon does hit, which isn't very often, it doesn't do much damage. So after I've set up enough Workups to take out the Leave Annie waiting in the back, I knock out the Swadloon with a return. Then Dwebble comes out. Dwebble has Sturdy, which in my opinion is one of the most frustrating abilities when it comes to hardcore Nuzlocks. For those of you who don't know, Sturdy prevents a Pokemon from being knocked out at full health which is incredibly inconvenient if that Pokemon can do a lot of damage to your own Pokemon. Fortunately, Dwebble can not, and it goes down to a few attacks. But Sturdy is going to be a pain in the butt going forward. For now though, Berg's final Pokemon is Leave Annie. It's able to outspeed Bellatrix thanks to an earlier string shot, but Bellatrix is so bulky that even a critical hit wouldn't have been much of an issue. A single return finishes off the Leave Annie, getting us the third gym badge. From here, we can get our Route 4 encounter. From the sand, I can catch either Sandile or Scraggy. However, in Black 2, on Thursdays, Route 4 is also home to a static Mandibuzz encounter. Mandibuzz is a very bulky Pokemon that normally cannot be caught until much later in the game. This particular Mandibuzz is also special, because it has its hidden ability. Unfortunately, its hidden ability is Weak Armor, which is a pretty atrocious ability. Anytime Mandibuzz is hit by an attack, its defense gets lowered by one stage, and its speed gets raised by one stage. So after a few turns, Mandibuzz ends up being pretty vulnerable to even the slightest physical hit. This is a huge bummer, because Mandibuzz's regular abilities are pretty solid, and Mandibuzz's white 2 counterpart, Braviary, gets Defiant as its hidden ability, which is a pretty incredible ability. So Mandibuzz kinda got screwed. In spite of this, I decide to catch the Mandibuzz anyways, since the alternative is not catching it until right before the Elite Four. Plus, Mandibuzz's flying type might be pretty useful against Clay's ground types. I name her Yzma, and she joins the team. Next, I head to Relic Castle. Only Sandile can be found in the Relic Castle, which means that if I get my encounter here first, I'm guaranteed to be able to catch a Scraggy in the Desert Resort thanks to Species Claws. I name the Sandile K. Rule. Then I catch a Scraggy from the Desert Resort, and I name her Darla! Both K. Rule and Darla have the ability Moxie, which is truly one of the best abilities in the game. Every time a Pokemon with Moxie knocks out an opposing Pokemon, its attack gets raised by one, 
In the right conditions, this sets up for some pretty monstrous sweeps, especially on a fast Pokemon like Crocodile. I make sure to go back to Route 19 to max out K. Rule's attack and speed, and Darla's attack. Then, K. Rule evolves into Crocorock. I never really knew that I was mispronouncing that until somebody commented on it in a video. But I guess Crocorock makes a lot more sense than Crocorock. Whatever, this generation came out when I was like 15. I was an idiot back then. Fast forward 11 years, and I'm still an idiot. While training to the level cap for Elisa, Yzma is fighting a Liopard, who starts with a fake out. Right away, that's a defense drop with weak armor. Then it goes for a Fury Swipes. Now the fun thing about weak armor is that it activates every single time that I'm hit by a multi-hit move. So of course this Liopard manages to get 5 hits of Fury Swipes off, including a critical hit, which manages to lower Yzma's defense all the way to minus 6. Fortunately, Yzma lives, but another Pluck isn't going to finish this thing off, so I have to switch out. And that's when I find out that this Liopard also knows Pursuit. So, with all those defense drops, the boosted Pursuit is more than enough to knock out Yzma on the switch. Weak armor. Not a great ability. So much for using Yzma for clay, I guess. And given that one of the Elite Four members, Marshall, uses fighting types, this is a really unideal death. But at least for now, I don't have to immediately deal with the consequences. Because next up is Elisa and her electric types, which aren't too much of an issue with K. Rule. Elisa leads with an Emolja. It uses a few quick attacks as I retaliate with Rock Tombs. Even though Rock Tomb is super effective, Crunch would actually be more damage thanks to Stab, and it wouldn't miss, but I don't want to make contact with the Emolja in case Static activates. So after a few turns, Emolja goes down. Flaffy comes out, so I go for a Dig. Flaffy also has Static, but I'm holding a Cherry Berry in the case that it activates, which it doesn't. Elisa then sends out her Zeb Strika, but thanks to the Moxie boosts, a single Dig takes it out, and that wins us the fourth Gym Badge. Next up, I head to Driftvale City, where former Plasma Sage Rude gives me N Zorua. This particular Zorua always has 30 IVs and a hasty nature, so it's pretty powerful, if not a bit frail. Normally, you can't name this Pokemon, since it's technically registered to Trainer N, and you can't nickname other trainers' Pokemon. But with my special edition Nintendo DS, I can. So, I name him Loki. Loki also evolves, but I forgot to record that. But basically what happens is that the little fox evolves into a half-fox, Half man, all furry bait looking thing. Zorark. Anyways, now it's time to face Clay and his ground types. And this gym ends up being pretty sloppy because I went in thinking that Bulldoze can hit Pokemon underground. Turns out, that's not true. Knowing that would have made this a lot easier. Clay leads with Krokorok and I lead Darla. He goes for a Torment and then I take it out with a Brick Break. Moxie gives me an attack boost to offset the Intimidate from Krokorok as Sandslash comes in. Sandslash uses Fury Cutter as I go for a payback. Sandslash then hits another Fury Cutter, which is building up power each turn, and I hit a Feint Attack to put it in the red. I don't actually want to knock it out here because I need to do a little bit of setup before the Exadrill comes in. On the next turn, I switch to Bellatrix as Clay uses a Hyper Potion. The idea is to switch to K. Rule on a Bulldoze when Sandslash is at low health. K. Rule is holding an Air Balloon, which makes him immune to Ground-type attacks. If I can kill the Sand Slash with K. Rule, that'll give me a Moxie boost, which will make Exadrill a one-shot with Dig. Plus, the Air Balloon will prevent Exadrill from hitting me underground with Bulldoze based on my incorrect assumption. Sand Slash uses Bulldoze a few times as I go for Feint Attacks. Once I'm slower, Sand Slash starts a rollout as I go for Moonlight. So I switch to Darla, who resists Rock-type attacks. Then I use Sand Attack, hoping to get Sand Slash to miss, but Rollout is now starting to get really strong. I switch back to Bellatrix, who gets hit by a very hard rollout. Unfortunately, another rollout will kill, and I can't risk Bellatrix on a miss, so I have to take the Sand Slash out with a Feint Attack. No Moxie boost for K. Rule, I guess. Exadrill comes out next, so I switch to K. Rule, who dodges a Bulldoze thanks to the Air Balloon. Then I use Dig. This leaves Exadrill with just a Sliver, who retaliates with a brutal Metal Claw. If that Metal Claw had crit, that would have been the end of Moxie Crocodile. At this point, I still think that Bulldoze will hit me when I'm underground, so I'm starting to panic. But fortunately, someone in Twitch chat says that it just won't. And after a quick trip to Bulbapedia, I find out that they're right. So a final dig knocks out Exadrill, and I win the battle. You know, 99 out of 100 times, Twitch chat will be completely wrong about something that they so confidently say. And this is actually even more true about YouTube comments. But every now and then, that one time out of 100 ends up saving the day. So thank you, Twitch chat. That's badge number five. The 4th through 6th gyms in this game are nearly back to back to back, so it's not too long before we're taking on Skyla. 
Before that, Darla evolves into Scrafty, but that's not particularly helpful against Skyla's flying types. She leads Swoobat, and I lead Bellatrix. Now that Bellatrix knows Moonlight, there's a lot of battles where she can just set up with Workup and then Sweep. And this is one of them. Leftovers in Moonlight keep me healthy until I set up two Workups. Then I go for a Feint Attack, which Swoobat actually survives because it has the ability Unaware. I didn't realize that until a few turns later when Swoobat survives another Feint Attack despite me going for another Workup. Well, no harm, no foul. A quick attack knocks out the Swoobat, and then whatever this thing is supposed to be comes out. It looks kind of like a big white chicken that swallowed one of those styrofoam pool noodles. No way is Swana based off of a real bird. Anyways, I heal up with Moonlight as Swana misses an Air Slash. Then I hit it with a Feint Attack, which brings it into the yellow after Citrus Berry recovery. I anticipate it going for a Roost, so I get in another workup. I also set up a few more workups, as Swana just does some small damage with Air Slashes. Retrospectively, I'm not sure how I got away with this, because Swana knows Feather Dance, and could have absolutely dropped my attack. But it just doesn't. So after a Moonlight, a Feint Attack takes out Swana, and Skarmory comes in. Bellatrix isn't super strong, and Skarmory is pretty defensively tanky, so it does take three Feint Attacks to knock it out. But Bellatrix was never in any real danger here. Imagine losing a Pokémon to some big dumb bird. That's badge number six. From here, we hitch a flight to Lentimos Town. Outside of Reversal Mountain, I get another encounter, a Skoruppi, which will evolve into the Dark-type Pokémon Drapion. I name him Venom, and Venom has the ability Battle Armor, which might be one of the best abilities to have in a hardcore Nuzlocke. Battle Armor blocks critical hits, which means that you don't have to play around them. This makes most battles significantly easier and way less risky. Skoruppi can actually either have Battle Armor or Sniper, so between getting double Moxie on K. Rule and Darla, and now getting Battle Armor on Venom, I've gotten really lucky with abilities. Pretty soon after he joins the team, Venom evolves into Drapion. After the 6th gym, this game starts to really pick up in terms of difficulty. The levels become high enough that the random trainers have pretty strong Pokémon that can be really difficult to beat if you aren't prepared for them. For example, there's an unavoidable double battle in Reversal Mountain between two trainers that have an Exedrill and a Darmanitan, and you have to beat them with the paperweight that is Bianca's useless Musharna. I'm lucky enough to make it out of that in one piece, but a few unfortunate critical hits would have spelled disaster. On the other side of Reversal Mountain, I head to Route 14 to catch an Absol. Well, that's okay. Fortunately, I can also find an Absol on Route 13. I manage to catch this one, and I name him Scar. Unfortunately, as cool as Absol is, it's a little too slow and a little too frail to be particularly useful, so Scar just goes in the box. After traveling through a bunch of routes with some pretty tough trainers, I get to Opelucid City. And then I head to Route 9, where I can catch a Pawniard. I name him Shredder. Pawniard is one of those Generation 5 Pokémon that evolves at a ridiculously high level, so Shredder isn't particularly useful right now, but he will be soon. I make sure to max out his attack and his speed for later. Next up is Drayden. Without a reliable counter, Drayden can be really challenging. His Haxorus with Dragon Dance is pretty terrifying, and can wipe a lot of teams after just a single setup move. But now it's time to show how great of an ability Battle Armor is. We're gonna set up a sweep with Venom. Drayden leads with a dragon made out of Duplos, and I lead Venom and I start setting up Hone Claws. Since Drudagon can never crit, I can get away with setting up three Hone Claws without even worrying about getting knocked out. After three Hone Claws, Ice Fang is a guaranteed kill against all of Drayden's Pokémon. I can't even miss the Ice Fangs, since Hone Claws ups your accuracy. Now, before you Smarty Pants YouTube commenters get a hand cramp typing out your brilliant gotcha comment, yes, I do know about Dragon Tail. All of Drayden's Pokémon know the move Dragon Tail, which is a move that forces the opposing Pokémon out of battle. Kinda like Roar, except it does damage. If Drudagon had used Dragon Tail before I set up all three Hone Claws, I'd be screwed, right? Wrong. Stop typing out your comment. Venom knows Rest. If Drudagon went for a Dragon Tail, all I'd have to do is switch Venom back in, use Rest, and then get back to setting up. With the right amount of tactical maneuvers, I could do this until Drudagon runs out of Dragon Tail PP, and then set up from there. Fortunately, Drayden saves us both a ton of time, and I get a really easy setup. That's badge number seven. From here, it's a pretty quick turnaround to the 8th gym leader Marlin. There's some Team Plasma stuff, but it's all skippable since our team is actually pretty powerful at this point. However, before getting to Marlin, we do need to fight his gym trainers. And... well, let me just throw it over to this dipshit to walk you through what happens. Okay, this person has a Pelipper, so I was looking at the wrong person. Good thing it's a Pelipper. This thing can only use Stockpile, Swallow, and Spit Up, so...
Okay, let's break down what just happened there. When I'm doing these challenges, I will often use Cerebi's Poke Earth as a resource to find out which Pokemon each trainer has. This usually works really great. Cerebi has a really good layout and is pretty thorough with their coverage. But the trainers are usually just presented in a list, so if there's two trainers of the same trainer class in an area, it can be kind of hard to tell which one Cerebi is referring to. Most of the time, they're listed in the order that you're likely to encounter them. But not always. So I was not expecting a Pelipper. I was expecting a completely different trainer. Though, to be honest, I'm not even sure I would actually have used another Pokemon, even if I did know it was the Pelipper trainer, because as I ironically said before this thing killed arguably my best Pokemon, it's a Pelipper. Now, this specific Pelipper has a moveset exclusively made up of Stockpile, Spit Up, and Swallow. These three moves are a fairly gimmicky set of moves introduced in Generation 3, where a Pokemon can use Stockpile up to three times. Each time, Stockpile raises the user's defense and special defense. After using Stockpile, a Pokemon can choose to use Swallow to swallow the Stockpile and recover health, or they can use Spit Up to attack with their Stockpile. The more the Pokemon uses Stockpile beforehand, the more health that Swallow recovers, and the more base power that Spit Up has. Given that this is a fairly niche set of moves, I've never actually known what base power Spit Up has after various amounts of Stockpile building. Turns out that after three stockpiles, Spit Up has a base power of 300. So yeah, since this Pelipper is a quitter, Venom died to a Pelipper throwing up on him with the equivalent force of a super effective stab earthquake. RIP Venom. That's my bad. Rest well, buddy. For those of you keeping score at home, the only two deaths that I've had in this run have been the only two Pokemon that I can get that aren't weak to fighting type moves. The Elite Four is going to be really fun. But before that, it's time for Marlin, who apparently is not as difficult as his gym trainer with a Pelipper. He leads Caracosta, and I lead Darla. This Caracosta has Sturdy, and I'm anticipating a Shell Smash. So to gain as much HP back on the next turn with Drain Punch, I hit it with a Soft Crunch to break the Sturdy. But then Caracosta uses Scald. So it takes a few more Drain Punches to take it out, because Marlin heals with a Hyper Potion. Wailord is next, but two Drain Punches take it out, and get me back to full health as it just wastes time using Amnesia. Last is Jellicent, who goes down to a single crunch, thanks to my two Moxie boosts. Surprisingly, Scald never burned here, but I'm pretty sure I had a Rossberry in case it did. I don't really remember. Regardless, that's badge number eight. Before heading to the Elite Four, I need to head to the Giant Chasm to stop Team Plasma. Along the way, I get my final encounter, a Sneasel. I know that I can technically still get Azuelos from Victory Road, but since I can't evolve it into Hydreigon, I'm not going to. And before you say, Eviolite Zuelos is actually pretty good, I want you to really just think about whether using one of my six team slots on a Pokemon with the ability Hustle and a base speed stat of 58 is actually a good recommendation. Anyways, I named the Sneasel Hella, and then after maxing out her attack and speed, Hella evolves into Weavile. Hella doesn't help me with my martial problem, but a quick speedy ice type might help with Iris. Up next is a battery of Team Plasma fights but a majority of them are pretty trivial with Moxie boosts from K. Rule, even the Colrus fight. So we can just skip all that and jump straight to the climax of the story, where I have to fight Kiram and then Getsis. I've delayed evolving Shredder up until this point because Ponyard learns Sword Stance at level 57. Bisharp doesn't actually learn Sword Stance until well past the level cap. And with Sword Stance, Bisharp is an absolute monster, so this was pretty necessary. First is Kiram, but it falls to a Steel Gem boosted Iron Head before it can do any damage. After knocking out that legendary in one shot, Getsis gets a little cranky and comes at me with all his might. Now Getsis' team is actually pretty powerful. Unfortunately for him, he leads with a Kofagregis, which can't really do anything to Shredder, since Shredder is immune to Toxic and Psychic and resists Shadow Ball. So after setting up Swords Dance, Shredder just rips through Getsis' entire team with a combination of Night Slashes and Iron Heads. And that's the end of Team Plasma. Next up, it's time for the Elite Four. Before that is Victory Road, and there are a handful of trainers that can be really difficult to deal with, most notably the unavoidable veteran trainers at the very end that have a throw and a sock. Fighting types give me a lot of trouble now that Venom is six feet under the ground, but fortunately I make it through without any major issues. Even the final rival fight is a pretty easy sweep with K. Rule. So let's just move on to the Elite Four. I've decided to leave Scar the Absol and Loki the Zorark in the box. So here's the final team, leveled up to level 58 to match the aces of all four of the Elite Four members. Let's see if we've got what it takes. First up for the Elite Four is Chantal and her ghost types. But Chantal also leads a Kofa Grigis, which means that Shredder is able to set up a sword stance and then sweep through her team. I do have to hold a Rossberry to heal the burn from Will-O-Wisp, but then her Pokemon all go down to a single hit apiece. 
the ghost type trainer was never going to be a huge problem for my dark types. Speaking of not being a huge problem, next is Caitlyn, who uses psychic types. Her Musharna literally can't hit K. Rule with its move pool, so I go for a Hone Claws as she switches to Reuniclus. Then it's just four crunches for an easy victory. That's all she wrote. Third up is Grimsley, but he uses all dark type Pokemon like some sad, edgy 14 year old that shops at Hot Topic. How embarrassing. He leads with a Liopard. Again, what, what a loser. Imagine leading an Elite Four battle with something as weak and useless as a Liopard. After the Liopard uses Fake Out, Darla is able to take her out with a Drain Punch. And thanks to the Moxie boosts and the health gain from using Drain Punch, Darla is able to sweep through the rest of Grimsley's team. Pretty sad that his entire team can get swept by fighting type attacks. With that, there's just one more Elite Four member to face, Marshall. He's easily the hardest trainer in the entire game for my specific team of six. That's because every single one of my Pokemon is weak to fighting type moves, and Marshall has a sock with the ability Sturdy, which prevents me from knocking it out in one shot. A critical hit Brick Break from Sock will easily one-shot my entire team. Marshall also leads with a throw, which is pretty bulky and has the move Storm Drain, which always crits, meaning that it's a bit harder to set up. It also has Rock Tomb, which can lower our speed, so it's a pretty tough problem to solve. The solution I come up with starts by sacking Thanos. Thanos will start by doing enough damage with Aerial Ace to put the throw in the range of an Earthquake kill with K. Rule, who gets a free switch in after throw knocks out Thanos. From there, Moxie boosts will allow me to sweep through Marshall's entire team. As for the sturdy sock, well, I taught K. Rule the move Fling, which is a dark type move that hurdles the user's held item at the opponent. The damage done by Fling is determined by the item that is flung. However, a few specific items also result in added effects. One of these items is the Razor Fang, which when flung, causes the opponent to flinch. So, by using Fling with K. Rule, I can flinch the sock while breaking sturdy and then kill it on the next turn. It's a pretty flawless strategy. The battle begins with Marshall sending out Throw. I lead Thanos, who hits a little bit of damage with Fake Out. Then it's time to sacrifice Thanos after doing a bit of damage with Aerial Ace. Only, instead of that, Thanos decides to get a critical hit, which kills the Throw in one shot. That's not really according to plan, but that's okay, because Mind Shao comes out next. I can do the same thing here. Get damage on the Mind Shao, sack Thanos, and then sweep with K. Rule. But evidently, Thanos had a different plan. See, Thanos saw the state of the world. He saw that overpopulation was driving the Pokemon world to the brink of extinction. He saw that something had to be done, or else the world would destroy itself. To save life as we know it, Thanos knew that he had to wipe half of existence off the face of the planet, including half of Marshall's team. So, he gets another critical hit with Aerial Ace, knocking out Mind Chow in one shot. Now things are bad. Very, very bad. With Mind Chow down, Conkeldor comes out. And this thing is very bulky, which means that K. Rule won't be able to easily knock it out. An Aerial Ace hits Conkeldor for a chunk of damage, and then it retaliates with a Hammer Arm, finally knocking out the Mad Titan. Thanks for absolutely ruining my Martial strategy, you dumb cat. From this health, K. Rule won't kill Conkeldor with an Earthquake, so I need to get Conkeldor to under 50% before safely bringing him in. Unfortunately, that does mean that I'll need to make another sacrifice. Based on who I think I'll need for the final battle against Iris, I bring in Bellatrix. Bellatrix uses Feint Attack for a tiny bit of damage that actually isn't even enough to drop Conkeldur below 50%. But fortunately, Conkeldur misses with Hammer Arm. This lets me go for another Feint Attack, but I completely forget about the Citrus Berry, which activates and brings Conkeldur out of kill range. So Bellatrix goes down, and I'm in the same position I was in, but now I have one less Pokemon. Rest well, Bellatrix. I'm sorry your sacrifice was for naught. So, I need to make another sack here. Next up to the slaughter is Hella. She hits an Ice Punch, which leaves Conkeldur with a sliver, and then she goes down. I bring in K. Rule, but this is starting to look like a wipe. Marsha will heal here, and I can't take this thing out in two shots. But there's nothing else to do here. So after Marsha heals, I go for an Earthquake. A crit! That is literally a run-saving crit because one more Earthquake knocks out the Conkeldur, and then Sock comes in. So I break Sturdy by using Fling, and then a final Earthquake knocks it out, and that wins us the battle. K. Rule coming in absolutely clutch. That's Marshall and the Elite Four defeated. It just cost me half my team. Thanos crit half of Marshall's team, and the aftermath resulted in the loss of half of mine. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. From here, it's time to take on the Champion Iris with three Pokemon. 
The plan is to sweep through her team with Darla until it baits out Archeops. Then, by sacking Darla, I can get a safe switch to K. Rule, who will bring Archeops into defeatist range. From there, I can set up a Swords Dance with Shredder, and then sweep through the rest of Iris' team. Shredder even knows Dual Chops, and I attached a Wide Lens to him to deal with the Focus Sash on her Haxorus. So, Iris leads Hydreigon, and I lead Darla. She uses Dragon Pulse as I go for a workup. On the next turn, I take Hydreigon out with a Drain Punch and gain most of my health back. Drodagon comes out next, which is why I needed the workup boost. At plus two, an Expert Belt boosted Ice Punch is just enough to one-shot the Drodagon. Third is Aggron for some reason. I have no idea why. It doesn't have a move that's super effective against Darla, so I don't know what's going on here. But either way, a Drain Punch knocks it out. And then in comes Archeops. So it's time to sack Darla for the clean switch. Only problem is that Darla is an absolute animal and manages to survive in acrobatics. Like an idiot, I click Ice Punch, so that kills the Archeops. And this is a run-ending mistake, because Haxorus comes out next. She takes out Darla with a dual chop. Then K. Rule comes out. I use Fling to break the Haxorus's Focus Sash, but an Earthquake isn't enough for a one-shot, so Haxorus gets a Dragon Dance off. And with that, she's able to outspeed and knock out K. Rule with an X-Scissors, and kill Shredder in one shot with an Earthquake. And that's the end of the run. You know, I wiped the champion in a lot of my runs, especially when streaming on Twitch. But every other time that it's happened on Twitch, I can at least attribute it to unfortunate luck. In this case, I simply played poorly, and I have no good excuse for why. I had a game plan, and I got reckless. The play was to always use a non-damaging move with Darla in case it survived the attack from Archeops. There was zero reason to use Ice Punch. It was sloppy, and the game punished me for it. Now, I did go back and start this challenge over again, and I do want to show you how that went, but this video is already really long, so I'm going to save it for another separate video. The next set of attempts ended up being really fun, and they were different enough from attempt 3 that I think it's actually worth showing what happened in detail instead of glossing over it and just showing you the very final champion battle. So part 2 of Pokemon Black 2 with only Dark-type Pokemon will be coming your way very soon. It really was a lot of fun to try this challenge again, after a bit of a break, so I hope you'll check it out. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching and for all your continued support. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't. I, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitch and Twitter to keep up with streams of my future challenges. And you should also join the Flygon HG Community Discord where you can discuss nuzlocking and make recommendations for future challenges. The link is in the description below. So stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.